name's Rebecca. Welcome. I'm your host. Uh, they also call me Crafting Journey, and on Instagram, you can find me at that journey chick. Yep. The links to all those are down in the description. So, how was your weekend? Mine was fantastic. <laughs> I did not do any cross stitch. It's supposed to be, it was supposed to be a cross stitch weekend, but I needed to go over, check on the grandkids. They're fine. You know, two of them are all adults now. <laughs> They're, but they were all three there and we had just a wonderful, we all sat in the living room and chit chatted and yeah, it was wonderful to get to visit with them. Hold on. I just wanted to make sure that they hadn't burned the house down. <laughs> I wanted to make sure they had dinner, so um, I brought, they, I was like, what do you want? Oh, we want macaroni and cheese. So I bought some, some boxes of macaroni and cheese, and my granddaughter made it for them. <laughs> That's what they wanted. And I, I did throw in a bag of Chips Ahoy, because I, I, I'm the grandma. I can do that. My son would cringe, but whatever. So, and then I played the beta edition of Diablo 4, so that's over. It was only open for the weekend. Um, yeah, I do want to get that game. I really do. Yes. So, but budgets are really tight. <laughs> anyway, enough about me. I am, this is Murdaw Monday. Yep, Murdaw Monday. It keeps going and going. The gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the death of Stephen Smith, loosely associated with the Murdaws. But I'll tell you, as I cover it, what the association is. But first, I want to give you some updates. Now, there is there was supposed to be a trial in April of Charles Adelson. Charles Adelson is a dentist or periodontist from Miami, South Florida. I don't think he really practiced in Miami. He hung out in Miami, practiced in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, I'm from South Florida, so I know that area. Anyway... He is the brother of Wendy Adelson, who was the wife, I hope you're following this, who was the wife of Dan Markell, who was the FSU law professor that was murdered, I think, back in 2014. So I've already covered the trial of the two hitmen that he allegedly hired and his ex-girlfriend, Catherine McManawa, who helped him hire those hitmen. One of those hitmen was her baby daddy. And so he paid $100,000 allegedly to those three individuals to carry out the murder of Dan Markell because his sister wanted to leave Tallahassee with their two boys and come to Florida, South Florida. Uh, she didn't like living in Tallahassee. and But Dan Markell at the time had gotten a court order saying that she could not leave Tallahassee with their children because they had joint custody of the children. So she was very unhappy with him. I don't know why she has not been charged yet. I think there's more to come on this case. Uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Another gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. So that case was set for April. However, the defense attorneys for Charles Adelson said, we need more time. There is so much information. A lot of it is in Spanish and we have to get it interpreted. And uh, yeah, we, we need more time. And the judge says, well, that's understandable. So um, it's off the table. It's, they're going to try to reset it for September-ish. So that's down the line. Meanwhile, Charles Adelson is sitting in jail with no bail. Yeah, without a bond. Not allowed. Yep. And he's not looking good. <laughs> he is not. He's not the dapper man that, you know, had had the ladies' attentions down in Miami. Not anymore. Okay. Then there is another trial that started last week. They're still in jury selection. Today it would be day five of jury selection. And I kind of, I looked at this to see, is this something I really want to cover for you guys? Because there's been so many antics of the defendant. And uh, what is her name? Let me find out her name. Letitia Stouch. Okay. So Letitia Stouch has been charged with the murder of her stepson, who was 11 years old. And it was a very, very brutal murder. And... <laughs> She has had so many antics since being in custody. She tried to break out of jail with a broomstick. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's just been we really really a weird weird case so i'm not going to cover that because you guys don't like when i cover the deaths of children and especially the one as brutal as this one is yeah i won't even go into how she murdered him you, you just don't want to know so i will be covering starting next week the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. She is charged with the murder of her sons, her son and her daughter, and the murder of her husband's wife. She was she wasn't her husband's wife wasn't even deceased a couple weeks before she married him, and they ran off to Hawaii. Um, so that murder, the murder of her children, she's charged with. Her case has been separated from Chad Daybell, her husband, because she has asked for a speedy trial. So jury selection will begin next week on that case. It is not going to be covered. The judge has ordered no live video, no recordings. The media has to purchase the transcript at the end of the day. And then they can report out what happened that day. And that's what I will do, use as a resource to you so I can bring you what happened in the trial. So it's going to be delayed, not going to be live. It'll be delayed by a day or two when I can bring that to you. In the meantime, I'll bring you some true crime stories. But today, we're going to talk about the death of Stephen Smith. Are you still with me? Wake up. <laughs> All right, here we go. Stephen Smith. So... Here's why you're hearing so much about Stephen Smith's murder. This is a death that occurred uh, back on July 8th of 2015 in Hampton County. Yeah, so a long time ago, eight years ago. So what happened recently is last Friday, well, not this past Friday, Friday before, Sandy Smith, Stephen's mother, hired the bland Richter law firm to represent her, to help her. She wants to have her son exhumed and she wants a private autopsy of her son. So she hired this law firm and they, they agreed to do it. Eric Bland and uh, his partner agreed to do it pro bono. They're not charging her a thing. She started a GoFundMe to raise money for the private autopsy of her son, Stephen Smith, and raised, at last, last time I looked, $83,000. Because it's going to cost a hot, a hot, you know, dollar to... Is that a thing? A hot dollar? You know, you know what I mean. It's going to cost a pretty penny. Pretty penny. That's what I should have said. Pretty penny. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And so I'm going to get back to this hiring of the law firm in a little bit. But first I want to talk about what happened to Stephen Smith. So Stephen Smith's body was found in the middle of the road, uh, in the middle on Sandy Run Road in Hampton County um, by a passerby. He called 911 and he said, hey, there's, there's, a, there's a guy out here. He's in the middle of the road. He's going to get hit by a car. And the dispatcher says, I'm going to send someone out. So shortly after that, the Hampton County sheriffs respond and they call in the highway patrol. Now, highway patrol's job is to investigate vehicular deaths, deaths by vehicles, because they thought, well, he must have got hit by a car or he was shot, because what they saw was very, very gruesome when they found his body. He had a seven-inch gash on the right side of his head. Um, they said his right side of his head was kind of caved in from blood force trauma. His face was covered in blood. Um, he didn't really have any other major injuries on him, some scratches on his arms and, and his hands. Nothing consistent with being hit by a car. They couldn't find any skid marks. There was no vehicle debris anywhere. He had his cell phone on him. His shoes were on his feet, loosely tied. Now, from what I understand, force and <laughs> And friction will take your shoes off if you're hit by a car, especially if they're loosely tied. His vehicle was found three miles away on another road, Blanchard Road. I'm sorry, Bamberg Road, another three miles away with the gas cap open, his wallet in the car. Now, if you believe that he broke down and he ran out of gas, 
He walked for three miles. Now he had his cell phone on him. Why didn't he call for help? We don't know. So he never called for help. That's just one of the strange things. So none of the investigators thought that this was, that he was murdered. They, they thought Initially, maybe he was shot in the head. So they had investigators, you know, scanning the area for gunshots, shells, casings, projectiles. Nothing could be found. But because there was no debris and there was no vehicle debris anywhere and no skid marks, um, South Carolina Law Enforcement Division was called in. So they get ready to do an autopsy on Stephen Smith and... The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division and Hampton County Sheriff tell the Highway Patrol people, you don't need to be here. You don't need to be present for this autopsy. We know it you know, didn't involve a, a vehicle. So they don't go to the autopsy. But then when the autopsy is over, the, the pathologist rules that it was a hit and run. <laughs> and so they, they had to call the Highway Patrol back in to take over the investigation. And when asked why she thought it was a hit and run, she said, well, because it wasn't a gunshot and he was found in the road, so I figured it was a hit and run. And they said, well, what led you, you know, are you, what led you to that conclusion? She goes, I don't know. It's not my job to investigate. It's your job. What? <laughs> so, yeah. So they, the case was closed. Hit and run. However... This case was reopened in June of 2021. Now, what happened in June of 2021? The murders of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. So they were murdered on June. I don't remember. It was in June. But later, the latter part of June, the, the murders occurred early in June. The latter part of June, uh, South Carolina South Carolina Law Enforcement Division announces they are reopening the case of Stephen Smith based on information discovered during their investigation of the murders of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. What? What happened? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Um, so, a little bit about what's been going on. Sandy Smith has been fighting for eight years to get some answers to why her son died. Um, she hired, first hired a, an attorney named Andy Savage and he agreed, they, they had an agreement, you know, that he would talk to her before he made any announcements that she would not talk to the press unless she talked to him. So it was a mutual agreement. Well, lo and behold, he talks to the press and says to the press, this is in October of 2021. Now, after Alex Murdoch has been arrested for the murders of Maggie and Paul, a month later, he announces that the Murdoch's had nothing to do with the death of Stephen Smith. There are other suspects that are being developed. However, a year after that statement he put out, which he never got Sandy Smith's permission to put that statement out, no one has ever been named as a suspect in the death of Stephen Smith. So she fired Andy Savage <laughs> because you didn't talk to me before you put that statement out. So she hires an, an attorney named Mike Hemlick. Really good guy, nice guy. He was doing his best for them, but then he took a job um, as with, the, with a public agency. So because he's working for the public now, he can no longer be their attorney. So he she goes and she hires Last Friday, not this past Friday, but the Friday before, she hires Eric Bland. And Eric Bland is the same lawyer that is representing the Gloria Satterfield family and handling the Gloria Satterfield matter. Yeah. So, good, good lawyers. So they, on Sunday afternoon, they're hired on a Friday. Sunday afternoon, they announce uh, to the media, they release a public statement to the media saying they're going to hold a press conference early Monday morning. Well, half an hour before that press conference is scheduled to start, Buster Murdoch puts out a statement <laughs> through his attorney, which happens to be one of the two guys that represented uh, Alex Murdoch, 
puts out through that law firm a statement. And here's what he had to say in his statement. I have tried my best to ignore the vicious rumors about my involvement in Stephen Smith's tragic death that continue to be published in the media as I grieve the brutal murders of my brother and mother. Then he goes on to stay in the statement. These baseless rumors of my involvement with Stephen and his death are false. I unequivocally deny any involvement in his death and my heart goes out to the Smith family. Here's the Murdaugh involvement. <laughs> in the police record of the investigation of Stephen Smith, the Murdaugh and Buster Murdaugh's name are mentioned several times, several times. Now, here is what Stephen Smith said to his sister prior to his murder. He told his sister that he was involved romantically with someone from a very prominent family in the county who was hiding his sexuality, and it would be a shock to people to know this person was gay. Um, the other thing that came to mind when I was learning that they have new attorneys is, you know, he had a phone on him. What was on that phone? Did they get the information that was on the phone. Who was he texting? Who was he talking to? Was he getting phone calls from anybody? I'd love to know that. So Eric Bland goes ahead and he has his press conference where he announces that he's representing the family, that he's doing this without charging them. And it's your usual rather the mill press conference. But all of a sudden now, every YouTuber is latched on to the Stephen Smith case. That's fine. You know, I think it deserves public publicity. I really do. Oh, this past week, Eric Bland gets a call from SLED and SLED, the chief of SLED, the chief of the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, who tells Eric Bland, listen, I want, our agency wants to partner with your law firm for this investigation and this exhumation of the body. So they do plan to exhume Stephen Smith's body and have a private autopsy. And SLED is now saying that they want to partner with this law firm in the investigation. So they're going to be sharing information. And one of the things this chief told Eric Bland was, you don't need to have this body exhumed. It's murder. So I don't know what information SLED has. I am dying to know what the information is that they had, that they're saying, you don't even need to exhume the body. We know it's murder. This is going to come out very soon. So stay tuned. Yeah. How interesting, right? So it's kind of associated with murder. It's kind of not, you know, we don't know. So I think the rumors started when his sister said, hey, this is what my brother told me. So then the rumors kind of started. You know, was it Buster he was having a relationship? Was it not Buster? You know, I don't know what the rumors are. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling you any rumors. I'm just saying, you know, there are rumors out there about Buster. What I would say is we probably should leave Buster alone. He is grieving, you know, that his father's now in jail. He's lost his mother. He's lost his brother. Um, and he's, he may not be involved, but I'd love to know who is. Here's the thought. There are a small group of people in that county that know what happened to Stephen Smith. Hopefully now that the Murdoch trial is over, they will come forward and they will tell people what they know. You know, Alex Murdoch's in jail. He can't come get you. Uh, Buster doesn't even live there anymore. Come forward and tell us what you know. So that's that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah. So meanwhile, uh, I have a thumbnail up for the verdict watch. I actually am watching for the verdict here. The jury has been deliberating. This is day two. They deliberated for couple of hours, two, three hours on Friday before they went home, um, and then resumed deliberations this morning with a question. The first thing they asked was, could they hear, uh, could they get a readback of the testimony of, what was his name?
David Beckwith. They didn't want the entire testimony. They only wanted the part where he was cross-examined regarding receiving immunity to testify. Yeah, that's the part they wanted to hear. So in true, you know, defense attorney fashion and attorney fashion, there had to be, you know, an hour and a half debate over which part they should hear. So they finally agreed on which part of the transcript transcript would be read back to the jury. So the judge brought in the jury. They read back that part. At that point, apparently a juror raised their hand and he said, if you have any questions based on what you just heard, you need to send that out to me in the form of a question and then I can answer it. So he sent the jury back to continue their deliberations. He had them, uh, he had the bailiff order lunch for them. Then they came back and said, uh, we need a where can we have a 15 minute cigarette break? You know, when they found out they were going to be served lunch and they needed to continue deliberations, the smokers were like, Oh no, we got to have a cigarette. He's like, fine. But at this point he would assign a bailiff to go with the cigarette smokers and a bailiff to stay with the jurors so that nobody deliberated while they were smoking their cigarettes. Um, and then once they come back, they could resume their deliberations, continue their lunch. And apparently that's what's going on right now. <laughs> lunch. I hope it's not pizza again. Oh my God. I would probably be getting really sick of pizza by now. I never, that's not true. I love pizza. <laughs> could probably eat pizza anytime. Anyway, so that's what's going on there. Yeah. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Let me do the crime calendar. I don't want to forget the crime calendar. All right. Monday, March 27th. Oh, you know what today is? Oh. <gasps> It's my bestie's birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Mickey Sunshine. Happy birthday to you. And many more. I don't know how many more she's going to have because she's out of coffee. Her roommate who makes her coffee every morning, he's in the hospital. I'm like, what are you doing for caffeine? <laughs> yeah, anyway. All right, a six-year-old is arrested. No way. Why do you hear what this is all about? In March of 2021, a six-year-old boy was sent to court in North Carolina, charged with injury to real property for picking a tulip from a neighbor's yard while waiting for the school bus. What the hell? What? The case made headlines throughout the U.S., drawing attention to the alarmingly young age at which children qualify for juvenile proceedings in the state. While parents are involved in all criminal proceedings for minors, according to the North Carolina Juvenile Justice Section, my poor clock, the children are expected to assist in their own defense. But the young boy charged with picking the flower was unable to follow the court proceedings, so his defense lawyer gave him a coloring book and crayons. Oh my God, this is ridiculous. Child advocates argue that children of 6 or 10, 12, or even 14 don't have the capacity to make the life-altering decisions involved in assisting in a criminal defense. They have suggested... A swath of alternatives involving raising the minimum age in states like North Carolina, including upping it to 12 or 14 or increasing it to 10 with evaluations for 11 and 12 year olds. What happened to the boy with the flower? I want to know. It doesn't say what his name is or anything. Just in North Carolina. Who said, get off my lawn? Who's pers what person called the police on this boy for picking a tulip? They need to be smacked in the head. Yeah, that's just my opinion. Anyway. Um, so when and if we get a verdict today, I will go live. You won't get much notice. I'm sorry. He gives the the, uh, the court personnel, have, he's told them that they need to be 20 minutes away and then so that he can call them back. Yeah. Can't be farther than 20 minutes away. So. I'm right here. I'm going to be diamond painting. Yep. I will see you guys tomorrow in Crafting and Crime Daily. Take care, everybody.